Okay, so again, uh, make your reservations. It's two weeks. I will be hammering everybody every other day. I will be doing a countdown as to when uh, 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 when to get in and when it's too late to get in your reservation. Um, I spoke with Ria Jaram, Hudson Regional Director of the ARRL, and she uh, will be attending also, and uh, she will be promoting it on her, her uh, weekly letter, too, uh, for QST. So um, uh, we can be very thankful about that. And again, she says, you're it. So uh, she's happy as hell to have us and to be with us. Uh, I, I will always need my usual suspects. Uh, I believe uh, I've already had uh, Bill Zukowski, uh, he agreed to do the gate. Uh, now I will need some people to do the, uh, to do the table inside uh, to collect the monies. So I'll be working on somebody uh, for that. Hopefully uh, I can get a hold of uh, Max, which he's been doing a very good uh, job for the past few couple of years too. So um, anybody else want to step up and help? We really appreciate it. Uh, so let's move on. It doesn't um, pay enough, Rich. It doesn't pay enough. Pay, doesn't pay enough? No. Uh, we'll, make, we'll make it good. We'll make a good pay. We'll okay. double what we, what we paid last year. Oh, okay. Uh, Max will be happy. Yeah. All right. Um, you may have seen, or I should hope you saw, email to uh, the communicator from Bill Zukowski, trustee of the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. And Bill was talking about the uh, AWA convention, which uh, happens uh, next month near Rochester, New York, and it is also canceled. Now, um, the presentations, if you've never been up there, uh, I mean, I, I can see a whole bunch of you guys who have been up there. I've been up there. Um, the presentations are amazing what they put together. So be it that they are not meeting officially, but they will officially have virtual presentations. All right. And those presentations will be given uh, starting, uh, I don't know, the, well, the date that it's available to viewers will be August 12th, and that'll be on their YouTube uh, website. Now, you don't have to be a member to view the presentations. They would love you to be a member, member because the way they, they talk about it in their, their letter, they kind of allude to the fact that, uh, yeah, well, you don't have to be a member, but sure would be nice if you were a member. So anyway, I'm a member. A lot of people in our club are members. I've been a member a very long time. Uh, yes, I know it's not what it used to be. Yes, I know they had their problems. I know all of that. But the presentations are uh, very well done. We know that. So um, in lieu of that, um, the presentations uh, will has a bit of a list here. And I'll just read off a few of them. Um, the uh, theme, again, was amateur radio, all right? So uh, uh, one, of the, um, one of the presentations was 126 years of amateur radio innovation. Uh, another was pre-1912 wireless and electrical. Uh, Westinghouse Broadcasting um, and Moonlight Restorations, which I, I know a lot of guys get involved in. And then the, uh, another one was the influence of Hiram Percy Maxim on amateur radio. Okay, so who was Hiram Percy Maxim? Who was Hiram Percy Maxim? Any takers? One of the founders. One That's of the it? founders of AWRL. Yeah, he started the AWRL. Yeah? Along with someone else. I can't remember who though at the moment. That's it? That's all he did? His father invented the machine gun. Ah! No, the Maxim silencer. <laughs> uh, gun silencer. Ah, now we're digging. Now we're digging. What an amazing family. I tell you, I, I, uh, I started researching this. I don't know why. It's just because uh, he's got this in interesting name, and I didn't know a hell of a lot about him. I just knew about the ARRL uh, influence. But um, unbelievable story. You got to, even just the Wikipedia, just look into him. He's unbelievable. And his dad, who was an inventor also. Uh, and... Uh, and Hiram Percy Maxim was at MIT, just like Jules. 
and uh, amazing character. And they made fortunes from, <laughs> from armaments, <laughs> in essence. And his father made the, uh, the Maxim uh, machine gun, okay, which uh, revolutionized uh, wars in uh, Africa and Europe in the uh, late uh, 19th century. And then, <clears throat> and then young uh, Percy, Hiram Percy, he uh, invented the silencer for it. Uh, and uh, other silencers for everything else that's ever been, every other armament that's ever been uh, in existence. And uh, another, uh, another strange fact is, in England, your muffler is called a silencer. And why is that? Because <laughs> Maxim also invented the muffler, because he was involved in automobiles. He was in, involved in automobile racing. He was involved in building uh, uh, carriages, uh, engines, you name it, he did it. And uh, also uh, dabbled in flying machines, which uh, literally never took off the ground. But uh, you got you to read about this guy and his life. And part of his life, <laughs> it's always made into a, into a movie in 1946. It was called So Goes My Love. And uh, it, it's just, you, you got it, it's unbelievable. So what I'm trying to get at is, is 66 years on earth, for ARRL and instituting that, he was also uh, part of the uh, American uh, League of Film Makers. Um, just, you know, just amazing. Uh, so ARL is, ARRL is probably maybe 15% of his life's work. And yet that's what we remember him for and what we know him for. So, uh, you know, please look him up. He's unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Plus, in a personal note, he's got one hell of a head of hair for an old guy like that, so unbelievable. So anyway, these presentations you will be able to see on YouTube channel of um, AWA starting August 12th. Okay. All right. Um, all right, I've already covered our Hanfest corner, so there's no use going over that. Is there any other new business anybody wants to talk about? Anybody at all? We're doing good. We're at uh, 50, 52 members. That's good. Uh, it's Neville. I got a, an idea to float. Go ahead. Uh, an idea kind of goes along with what Al was thinking about. But this idea would be an online Zoom clinic. Uh, since we really can't do clinics in person, we could do one online. The idea being to go through your collection and find a nice old AA5 radio that needs some work and raid about three old compact fluorescent lamps. And with that, you can probably bring that radio back to life. For instance, here's the collection of parts you can get from one and a couple of those. And I think it can be done. It could be a fun, you know, take place over a couple evenings. Uh, via Zoom. Everybody has a radio and a soldering iron and a couple of old CFLs taken apart and a pair of pliers and some solder and uh, you know we have at it, ask questions, get answers and uh, have a lot of fun. I don't know if anybody would be interested in that but I'd be glad to lead it if there was any interest. So I toss that out for idea, thumbs up, thumbs down, see what happens. Are we building transistor radios? The idea would be to restore an All-American 5 vacuum tube radio, the old type with the 50C5, 35W4, 12BE6, et cetera. You got a okay, couple you know, transistors there. Uh, well, I'll take those out of the collection. <laughs> That's well, there's, a, there's <laughs> electrolytic and stuff there. and um, Right. Yeah. Elect there's electrolytic and about yeah. uh, five or six uh, 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 plastic capacitors and a little couple of collection of resistors and a bunch of diodes. And, uh, you know, I think it can be done. You know, the lead uh, light bulbs, they, they have uh, a little uh, switcher inside them too. You know, the incandescent ones. Because I had them, one of them apart, yeah. Some of them do. Uh, they have fewer useful parts for us. And the recent ones are so cheap that the only thing they have is an over voltage or, or a little current source chip one capacitor and one resistor and the LEDs and that's it. The good part about those is they're RF quiet too. So th this would be for like newcomers, but uh, geez, I'd hate to see sparks and smoke. 
you know, coming out remotely. Hey, anybody, you know, uh, <laughs> we we bring a A fives to the clinics and fix them up. You know, while we could do it uh, online. Just an idea. You know, the stuffs and the LEDs are um, are potted when you go in there. I've tried to take some apart. I just broke a uh, one of my LED light bulbs uh, burnt out, and I broke it open to see what was in there. And this this was just a couple of days ago. That was what was in there. Yeah. Little, oh, and then this side actually there's more. This side has some surface mount, a lot of surface mount. What value is that cap, Sal? Maybe you can sell it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I break these things open for? <laughs> no, his parts are better quality than that. That's oh, why I, I always tell you, Dicky haps are much better than sound caps. Now you see the truth. Behind you me? see where he gets his caps from. See, you see, see my sign. Unfortunately, it's, it's backwards. Do you guys see it backwards? No, no, no it's it's right. Oh, is it okay? My, on my screen, it's, it's I see it backwards. <laughs> no, it's it's all right. All right. Anyway. All right, uh, Neville, that sounds an uh, interesting idea. It's, it's uh, great. You're always thinking. You're an amazing guy. Um, we'll toss it around on the communicator. If there's any interest, we'll set something up. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, all right. After a very, very brief intermission, uh, we will go on to our official presentation. Here's the intermission. Boy, that was quick. And we're back. Okay. Uh, all right, now we're going to have a presentation by our very own Alan Walkie, W2AEW. He will give us a presentation on the use of the Nano Vector Network Analyzer, the VNA, and how we can use it. Uh, Alan, for um, yeah, we have a lot of new members. How about introducing yourself and telling them a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, actually, let me just check with you because I, I think we had discussed possibly doing a two-part, a, a, a dual presentation, but yeah. let's see how everybody feels about it. Uh, the first one I was going to talk about was, uh, uh, sounds like a very technical topic, but turns out to have some interesting content for us radio type people, uh, third order intercept products in a receiver and how it affects your receiver operation. And then we talk about the VNA because okay. neither of the talks are more than, you know, probably 20 or 25 minutes. So I thought two of them would be good. Does that sound okay with everybody? We've got all night, Alan. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Actually, I, I like this format because, you know, I've, as you know, I've uh, delivered a couple of presentations at the club and uh, there's probably about half of you that I can put names to faces. I mean, I recognize, you know, most, most everybody from the club, but I, some people, it's like, oh, you, you refer to somebody's name and I have never met them or introduced or whatever personally. So I, I haven't been able to put names to faces until we, I see it on Zoom here. So this is good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a little bit of an introduction in case there's some folks that uh, you know haven't met before. Um, I'm a been a ham since uh, probably about 1979, um, and uh, you know dabbled a bit in uh, in antique radios and things like that too. But uh, mainly kind of uh, on the ham radio side of things. Um, for the last 14 years, I've been a field application engineer for Tektronix. So you can see some of the. I'm working from home, so I've got my half a million dollars worth of equipment sitting on my bench behind me <laughs> instead of uh, in my car. What's your address, Alan? <laughs> well, you got, my, you got my call sign. You can look me up on QRZ. You know where I am. So, but I know where you guys are now too. So, but um, but always been a bit of a hobbyist um, with electronics. Uh, you know, I was a design engineer, an application engineer uh, long before I even joined Tektronix as an applications engineer. Um, and always uh, did a bit of tinkering and things like that. And uh, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that I've got a, uh, a YouTube channel, just youtube.com slash my call sign, W2AEW. And uh, I've got uh, over 130,000 subscribers and a little over 16 million views on the 300 some odd videos that I've got up there. So uh, Great. Uh, feel, feel free to, there's always, there's an index file up there you can go to, to, to go find uh, the videos you're interested in and that type of thing. So uh you know, most of them are about 10 minutes long and you know, kind of deal with topics like we're going to be talking about today. Um, the ones today are a little bit more formal in that I actually use PowerPoint instead of pencil and paper, you know, for the presentation or most of what I do on my, my videos is a bit more handwritten on, on 
on paper or an electronic tablet uh, you know, in terms of notes, but uh, most of the videos are include you know, more technical and practical uh, content in terms of actual measurements and playing with test equipment and doing things like that. So um, you know, more than just a presentation like we'd be doing here tonight. So uh, anyway, with that, uh, I thought maybe we'd get started. What I'll, uh, I thought we'd talk about the third order intermod uh, topic first. It was, it, once, it's actually just about a six minute video that I have, but uh, when I do when we do a presentation on it, it turns out to be a little bit longer because we'll discuss things a little bit longer. Uh, but just kind of an interesting topic. It sounds like something, you know, why would I care? Uh, but uh, even from a, a listening to a radio standpoint, there's some interesting uh, reasons why we might care. So let me do a quick little share of this presentation first. And uh, let me uh, maximize that screen. And uh, let me know, you should all see the first slide. Let's let me know if you can see that. Yes. All right, cool. All right, so we're gonna talk about third order IMD or third order intermodulation distortion products in radio receivers. Uh, and why do we care? So we're gonna talk a bit about uh, linearity and distortion and how the two are related. We'll talk about what uh, IMD is, or intermodulation distortion uh, is. Let me turn, make a little laser pointer here. Um, we'll talk about what are some of the properties of these intermodulation distortion products and the effects in a receiver and what we can do about it. So let's first talk about linearity and distortion, right? Linearity uh, really can be defined as, you know, when the output of a circuit is perfectly proportional to the input that uh, if you double the input, you double the output, you half the input, you half the output. Um, and generally linearity means that you're not adding any kind of a distortion to a signal at all. So the output is essentially undistorted compared to the input. Um, and of course, in most circuits, the linearity or the performance of that circuit is dependent upon signal levels. You know, just about any circuit you can drive too hard and things start to go nonlinear. And when the things go nonlinear, you wind up creating distortion. So any nonlinearity in a circuit will lead to harmonic distortion, meaning if I, put, if I got a one kilohertz tone being overdriven into an audio amplifier, I'll create harmonics at the second, third, fourth harmonic. And then we'll also create intermodulation distortion products. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Okay, everybody clear so far? Okay. Nobody's snoring, so that's good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about linear and nonlinear circuits. So passive circuits, you know, passive filters, things like that are generally linear, um, you know, unless you get into things like saturating an inductor core or something like that. But passive circuits are generally linear and don't uh, generally distort things too much. Amplifiers usually are linear circuits. You want them to be generally uh, until you overdrive them or do something bad to them. You saturate them or drive them into cutoff or compression or, or limiting or something like that, then they can produce distortion products because they essentially are no longer linear at that point. So there's always a rating for that. Uh, mixers can really are really kind of a mixture of both, right? Um, but in a mixer, we're using nonlinearity as our friend. I mean, oftentimes the, there's a linear path through the mixer. There's also some nonlinear things going on in a mixer that give rise to the things that we use a mixer for, right? We're generally using a mixer in radios typically for uh, frequency conversion, right? We take an input signal, uh, mix it with some kind of a local oscillator to then frequency convert it. So we're intentionally creating these sum and difference products of the LO and our input signal to, you know, in this mixer to drop signals into an IF or convert them down into, into baseband or something like that. Uh, so that those sum and difference products are, you know, kind of give rise to uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about next with uh, intermodulation distortion. So, um, so mixers are usually the place where some of the, some of this is going to happen, but they can also happen in like IF amplifiers and front end amplifiers and things like that in a receiver as well. Okay. So what is harmonic distortion, right? So if we've got an input signal at a certain frequency, let's pretend this is an ideal spectrum analyzer. We're looking at uh, amplitude versus frequency, and I've got a signal at a certain power at some frequency called Fn. Uh, we'll call that our fundamental frequency. Uh, at two times Fn and three times Fn, four times Fn, et cetera, 
these are all known as harmonics and they'll be referred to as the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, etc. So anytime you just put a signal into a circuit and the circuit has some nonlinear properties, you're going to generate harmonic, harmonic distortion components. Um, so these, these tones will be present in addition to your fundamental. And that's just part of what happens. So that's harmonic distortion. I think everybody's pretty familiar with that. So it's rarely a problem in a receiver because if we've got a signal coming in, you know, we're listening to a signal at you know, 9.3 megahertz or something like that, you know, the second harmonic is going to be at 18.6 megahertz. So who cares? It's outside of the passband of what we're listening to. So it's generally not an issue. So for the most part, harmonic, you know, harmonic distortion of its, in and of itself is not usually a problem in a radio receiver because those, again, these products are out of band. Okay, nonlinearities in a circuit will cause harmonics to be generated and IMD to be generated. So let's talk about IMD and that effect. Okay, so what are intermodulation distortion products? Okay, it's really when, I, when you've got combinations of input frequencies and their harmonics, not necessarily just one input signal, but multiple input signals. So when I've got multiple input signals, you're going to create, you can create these intermodulation distortion products. Okay. I mean, you could think of a, a, a mixer kind of does that anyway, right? We've got an input signal and we've got the LO, and then we create some indifference frequencies from that, but we're doing that intentionally. But let's say we're listening on the radio and we've got two very strong signals very close together, right? Crowded band conditions on a contest weekend or, you know, really good propagation conditions on AM broadcast or whatever it might be. So we've got two very, very strong signals next to each other. Now, if those very strong signals go through some kind of a nonlinear device, it could, again, it could be the preamp of the radio, it could be the IF amplifier in the radio, we're going to create these sum and difference frequencies, okay? So we'll have our two input signals that are coming into that. We'll create one at F2 minus F1 and F1 minus F2, and these are called second order products because it involves essentially, you know, one signal and another signal, no multiples of any of them. So it's just a combination of two input signals. So we call them second order intermodulation distortion products. Now, of course, we're also going to get the harmonic distortion products as well. So these are the second order harmonic products, two times F1, two times F2. And kind of, as I mentioned, again, all of these distortion products so far are generally not really of consequence to us because they're pretty far away from the signals we're trying to listen to. Now we'll also get third order uh, harmonic distortion products. Again, really far away from what we're trying to listen to. They're there, but who cares? We don't worry about them. But when things get interesting as we start talking about I, you know, some of the other IMD products. So I could say, well, I've got two times F1 plus F2. That's a third order intermod product because it involves, you know, two times this frequency and one, and one of those. So we call that a third order product. But the, the, two times F1 plus F2 and two times F2 plus F1. Again, they're, these are higher order products, but they're, they're far out in frequency, who cares? But here's the ones we really worry about, these guys right here. These are third order products, right? Two times F1 minus F2 or two times F2 minus F1. You know, these are third order products, but look at, they're really close to our original input signals. So they might be a problem. They might be inside the passband of what we're trying to listen to, okay? So these are generally the ones that are an issue that we've got to worry about is these, these third order products. When people are talking about uh, IMD issues and things in a receiver, they're talking really about these products, the two times uh, F1 minus F2 and vice versa, not these uh, all the sum products or, the, or this the harmonic distortion. We're worried about these products here because they're sitting really close to these, these other input signals and therefore likely in band you know, to what we're trying to listen to. So again, these higher order products are third order, but again, generally not troublesome out over here. Okay. So what are some of the properties of these third order products? Um, well, number one, we, as we just established, they're close to these fundamental frequencies so they can cause some in band problems. Uh, the other th interesting thing is that as you vary the fundamental input power, the power in the third order products increases at three times the rate of that. So as the signals get stronger, you get these third order products that come up much faster and, ver and, and much stronger. So uh, 
you know, they get geometrically worse, you know, as, uh, as the input signals get higher. Okay. So what you could reach, well, there's a, a theoretical point where those two things would actually cross and actually have the same power where I've got an, an, these two input signals coming in and the third order products reaching the same power level um, as the input signals. Uh, that's, that's a theoretical point that's called the third order intercept. And you might see that as a figure of merit on some receivers and things like that. You know, what's the third order intercept of that? You know, the higher the third order intercept, the better the receiver is because the more, the less third order products are gonna be created at a given power level. Now we call this a theoretical point because generally the amplifiers and things like that will go into some kind of compression or limiting before you ever get all the way up to that power level. Okay, so it's really kind of an extrapolation of this, but it's a good figure of merit, you know, saying if I've got a receiver that's got a, you know, plus 20 dBm third order intercept product um, or intercept point versus a, you know, a 50 dB third order intercept product, right? The 50 dB third order intercept is going to be a much more linear receiver and be, you know, better suited for working in very strong signal conditions and things like that, okay? So these are some of the properties of these uh, third order intercept products. Now, this actually has some implications when we start figuring out what, how do we deal with them inside a receiver. So let's say I'm on the 20 meter band, I'm trying to listen to some low power DX on 14.2 you know, 14 megahertz, okay? And he's a low level signal sitting down here. And it's a, it's a contest weekend. And I got two big you know, alligator stations, one at 14.203, and one at 14.206, okay? Well, two times 14.203 minus 14.206 is gonna put a, an intermod product right there, right on top of the signal I'm trying to listen to, okay? So what do I do about that? I take a drink of my iced tea. So, so we, that's the problem is we can get, you know, and obviously in a contest weekend, you're gonna have more than just two tones. You can have lots of signals coming in so you can get third order products that will add up and cover up those weak signals that you're trying to hear. So uh, that, that's really generally where a problem can happen. Okay. And you can kind of recognize that because this, the signal you're trying to listen to is covered up by something that just sounds like noise, right? Because one of those signals is actually two times the other one. So it's a multiplication of the signal. So it's not going to sound like the original signal. Now, when the signals are modulated, like if we're talking about single sideband, for example, and signals two and a half kilohertz wide, you know, things get worse. The reason is you've got, you know, a single sideband signal here, a single sideband signal here, but because we have this factor of two in here, two times FX minus FY, makes the IMD signal twice as wide. So it, it's even worse than the previous picture because you could have signals that aren't exactly spaced the way we have it here and still have a, a wide interfering signal that's covering up the thing we want to listen to. Okay, so third order IMD can pose a real problem when we're dealing with strong signals you know, in a crowded band and you're trying to listen to the things down into the weeds. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Uh, one way to deal with this is that attenuation can be your friend. So think about that. Attenuation could be our friend for listening to weak signals. That doesn't seem to make sense, but let's take a look at it. The reason is because the IMD product drops faster than the weak signal as you add attenuation. So let's, let's do an example here. Let's add some attenuation. So let's say I add attenuation that's about one division of my, my grid paper here. So my weak signal drops by that attenuation amount. My two strong signals drop by that attenuation amount. But because of that three to one ratio between how fast the IMD products grow, the IMD signal dropped by three divisions instead of one. And guess what? It just down, dropped down below my weak signal. So the weak signal, yeah, it's, it's weaker than it was before by adding attenuation, but I've gotten, I've attenuated that, uh, distortion product potentially down below uh, my signal level so now I can actually hear it. So it's kind of counter counterintuitive to think that adding attenuation or reducing RF gain in a receiver can help you hear weak signals. Okay, And the answer is it can really help you hear weak signals when 
their those weak signals are are can't be heard because they're being covered up by intermod products from these adjacent stations. So that's really kind of the whole key. And again, a short little presentation, but it's one of those things to think about. It's like, why do I have an attenuator button on my ham radio to attenuate the input? Or why do I have an RF gain control on the radio? Both of those things are, are there to really help in this kind of a situation. I mean, the RF gain control can be used to kind of dial the, the noise level out when you're dealing with, when you're talking with some strong sig signals. But if the excessive gain in the receiver is due to, uh, is, to, is more than you really need, you're just opening yourself up for potentially covering up these weak signals with uh, some IMD products. So the lesson learned here is that the, the nonlinearities can lead to distortion, such as IMD products. Those third order IMD can be particularly troublesome in receivers because they're generally in band because they land very close to uh, the original, the, the other signals that are there. And counterintuitively, attenuation can sometimes help you hear weak signals, okay? So um, what I thought I might do, um, like I said, I did a video on this and the second half of the video, the last two minutes or so of the video um, really show this live on a spectrum analyzer. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd show that. So I'm gonna stop sharing the presentation here for a second and let me go and share my, let's see, let me share the web browser page, here we go. Um, let me also turn this computer sound on. See this video from this point forward. To the two upconverted tones, I see the third one of the third order intercept products uh, over here. Again, just 20 kilohertz away, because my original tones are just 20 kilohertz apart. What we can see at this set of yeah, you if depending on your screen, if you have like the video of everybody all, all the way over on the left hand side. Um, you might want to kind of grab it and move it to another spot on the screen so that you can see this tone over here. Settings that uh, my third order uh, intermodulation distortion product is only about 20 dB lower than the input signal level. Now, of course, the theory tells us that uh, if we drop the input signal level by a certain amount, that the third order intermodulation distortion product should, should drop by three times that amount. And we can see that here. If I put in approximately 10 dB of attenuation, we can watch that the main tone amplitudes drop by 10 dB, but that third order intermodulation distortion product dropped by 30 dB. So we can see, if I just repeat that a couple of times, it's very easy to see we're dropping about one division uh, in, this, in the spectrum analyzer on the main tones, but we're dropping about three divisions on the uh, intermodulation distortion product. And you can imagine as the input signals increase, third order inter, uh, intermodulation distortion product uh, eventually catch up with and be at the same magnitude of the input tones. And at that point, that's what we actually, we actually call the third order intercept point. What this also shows us is that there's some benefit to using attenuation at the front end of a receiver. If the receiver is looking for a low level signal that might be masked by a third order intermodulation distortion product produced by signals that are outside of the frequency range that you're looking at. Let's say for example, uh, we had a receiver tuned to uh, this frequency over here on the right and it was a signal that was sitting down, you know, say it may be minus 50 dBm or something like that and it's being masked by this uh, uh, IMD product. If we put some attenuation in the front end of that receiver, if we put 10 dB of attenuation in, we would drop the input signal by 10 dB, but we've dropped that third order product by 30 dB. If I uh, add some more attenuation in, uh, in this case it was another 10 dB, I may have dropped the input signal from minus 50 to minus 70, but I've dropped that third order product now down closer to minus 90. So it's now down below the level of the that weak input signal. So even though we've attenuated the input signal, we've attenuated that th the generation of that third order intermodulation distortion product by three times as much. So there is a benefit to actually using attenuation in conditions where you've got high signal levels surrounding a low level signal you're trying to see. OK. 
Okay, so that's uh, the, the, the first talk. I thought if you had any questions, we could talk about that. I don't know if you want to take a couple minute break before the second, but uh, I just thought it was an interesting topic, probably not something that you think about, uh, especially on, you know, on broadcast receivers or shortwave receivers, but uh, you know, especially with the conditions that we've had over the past couple of years, but hey, when the conditions come back, <laughs> signals get strong, you know, it might be something to start thinking about. Well, yeah, very... I... oh, go ahead, Al. Yeah, I, I'd make the comment that this is a problem that's exacerbated by a lot of modern receiver designs. Your, your traditional shortwave receivers had pre-selectors, tunable pre-selectors out at the front end of them. And cheap receivers now are very broadband on the front end. So you're open to all of this kind of problem. And so it becomes more of a factor than it would have been in, in a traditional radio. And some of the more expensive ham radios now, you can buy uh, accessories that will give you a tracking pre-selector on, uh, on your radio. So yeah, this is a very important topic. And there are some earlier receivers which had two RF stages in a row. And yeah. those are also susceptible to this by overdriving the first mixer. Yeah. So once again, you gotta have that RF gain control under control. I've observed that a lot of building uh, uh, receivers for like the 40 meter hand band at night mm -hmm. because that opens up really wide and just a little bit of attenuation and uh, the broadcast interference goes away because they're so strong. You'll have right. products that will fall right in the hand band with the, the weak, you know, those weaker signals. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make one more comment. I once scrapped a Western Electric shortwave receiver that was designed for harbor radio usage. And this thing had a crystal filter at the receive frequency right off the antenna. And yeah, that takes care of that, but of course oh, you yeah. can't do it. <laughs> the uh, pre-selector based receivers, uh, it's like the, uh, the old Drakes and stuff, they were pretty good. Uh, and you know, also the, the Collins R390, that, that had a heck of a, you know, with a slug rack pre-selector and stuff. Yeah. I've got an old Yesu FRG Frog 7, FRG 7, that's got a pre-selector oh, yeah. on it too. So, And then my, my little Drake 2B has got a nice pre-selector too. Yeah. So what do you think about the modern lines of uh, SDR receivers, say from ICOM and Yesu and the other ham equipment that's now transitioning to wide-banded front ends? Do you think they can cut it? In this yeah, day and I mean, age, I mean, they that that's exactly right. I mean, Al brings up a good point. I mean, that's exactly the problem you run into these things, like the you know very you know the very popular ICOM seventy three hundred. You know, that's that's got a, a pretty broad band front end because we're basically moving the bits closer and closer to the antenna, right? Having less, and so and the digitizer is seeing a much wider bandwidth. So any really strong signals anywhere within that captured bandwidth of the digitizer can potentially cause these kinds of problems. Now they're using high resolution converters and things like that, but at the end of the day, you, you, you start driving things too hard and you start uncovering the nonlinearities of those products and, and can have an issue. I think you know, something like a 7300 is fine for casual ham radio use, but it's probably not the radio you wanna have in a contest station. Yeah, real strong signal. But you know, for what it is, uh, you know, before I got it, that was one concern, especially on 40 meters at night where a lot of receivers fall apart. And uh, it, it handles it very well, even with the preamp, you know, when you're trying to force it to overload, putting a yeah. preamp on, it handled yeah. it pretty well, you know. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm sure that they, they've taken that into account in the design as much as they can to, to build enough, you know, linearity and headroom, you know, in the front end there. So yeah. the, with the, the receiver's got enough dynamic range that they can give some up to stay linear over a bro really broad input frequency range or input yeah. amplitude range. You'll see it worn, the uh, RF gain will flash red on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're overloading. Alan? Yeah. Can I ask a, a quick question? Sure. Is this, this is the, the nature of the beast. I'm not sure how, exactly how to word this. Is this the nature of the beast of a super heterodyne receiver? In other words, if you had a theoretically perfect TRF, Mm-hmm. 
and I know there's no such thing, but if you had it, this yeah. wouldn't happen. Well, it, it, it still potentially could, but probably not to the same extent, because even with, with a TRF, you know, and if it's perfect, uh, you know, it's a tuned front end, it's, you know, it's a tuned amplifier. So you're just tuned to a particular band, right? If you had very strong signals in that band and strong enough to start to drive that amplifier into compression or nonlinearity, you could create IMD just due to the nonlinearity in the amplifier. So it, it's, it would be a lot harder to do because the, the amps generally gonna have a lot more dynamic range and it's intended to be designed to be linear. Whereas in a superhet receiver, you're going through a mixer, which is intentionally nonlinear. Yeah. <laughs> so you, 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 it'll happen sooner, but at the end of the day, but you're right, a, a TRF will be more immune to this, but not completely, uh, not completely immune from it. Okay, and, thanks. And, and the rule of thumb in a superhet is you want to achieve your ultimate selectivity before you turn on any serious amount of gain. So you run minimal gain in the front end and through all that stuff until you get down to the final IF and then you do your amplification, which helps you avoid these problems. Right. Yeah, yeah and you want to run the, uh, the gain uh, into class A where it could handle very wide dynamic range without, you know, uh, overloading, compressing. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why the the generally the attenuator is there, uh, and the attenuator appears before the first mixer, right? Because you don't want to overdrive the first mixer and cause those problems in that first IF. Um, so, uh, so that that that's kind of your first line of defense. The second line of defense is IF gain, which will then turn down, or excuse me, the RF gain, which is really adjusting the IF amplifiers. Um, but uh, you know, having that attenuator available up front or you know, the DX and local switch on the shortwave receivers. It was basically there for the same thing, um, where it, uh, you, know, you really want to use that to attenuate strong signals when you're trying to pull, pull out the weak ones. Okay. Very good. Oh, and Al, congratulations. I saw you made, uh, you were recognized uh, by, in a QST. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of, uh, it was an honor to be selected for that. Uh, that member spotlight article that came out in July. So that was, that was kind of fun. They did a, about a, you know, an hour long phone interview about uh, three months ago. And so it just came out. So it was kind of fun. Well, you well deserved it. Cause I know you've really helped a lot of people in the ham community and we tutorials and all. No, I appreciate that. Appreciate that, Bob. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> okay. So, so that was the first one. Everybody's still awake to go for the second one. The good thing about this is that I can tell if anybody's sleeping. <laughs> you can also, you can also uh, count the participants. We only lost one. <laughs> hey, okay. All right. Well, I guess I didn't want the snoring to bother me. So, okay. <laughs> All right. So why don't we take a look at, uh, at my second presentation here. And this one kind of goes into a little bit of a different direction. And this is the uh, one that Bruce kind of mentioned uh, is no VNA. So let me share this presentation. Let me move my little dis video view of everybody over here. So um, this nano VNA, if you're still seeing my video too, it's got one right here. And just to kind of give you the size perspective, this is the v nano VNA H4, and this is an iPhone 7, not the, not the big 7, but just the normal size 7. So it's about the size of a cell phone. Let's just give you a size perspective here. Um, let's talk a little bit about this, and I'll talk about why here too. So let me get my laser pointer back. So our agenda today, you know, why do we want to talk about this? There's some interesting reasons. Um, and the main one is that these things are ridiculously inexpensive. This, the one I was just holding in my hands was $59, okay? Co goes up to 1.5 gigahertz. And it makes the, it really makes VNAs accessible to the hobbyists, okay? But first we want to talk about what is a VNA? Okay, so I want to start there because, again, most hobbyists never use one or never touched one. So what is it and what is it good for and why do we care? Why do we even want to talk about this thing? And then we'll take a look at the nano VNA. So it's not a tutorial on the nano VNA and, and that type of a thing. It's really a matter of what is it and then you could decide for yourself whether it's something you think we ought to go look at. Okay, so let's start with that first question. What is a VNA? Well, if you look up on Google or try to get a definition of a VNA online, you're going to find something like this, you know, an instrument that measures the magnitude and phase of the reflection and transmission properties of the ports of a device versus frequency. 
So that's all pretty clear, right? What? <laughs> what are we talking about? Right? So what does that really mean? Let's break this down and, and talk about really what, what that really means and why do we care? Okay. So kind of from a high level, um, you know, VNA is an instrument that's typically used to characterize RF devices. And we'll talk about what we mean by that. It could be amplifiers, filters, antennas, cables, you know, print circuit board tracers, traces, you know, mixers, things like that. Okay. They, they typically were only used by RF engineers in a professional environment because they're pricey. Okay, this one here in the middle, this one from Tektronix, is about a $10,000 unit, and that's an inexpensive VNA. You know, this one down here from Copper Mountain, about the same, you know, nine, ten thousand dollar price range. These are connected up to a, a PS, a, a PC over USB. Standalone benchtop vector network analyzers are typically fifteen, twenty, thirty, even well over a hundred thousand dollars. So these are these are not instruments that your average hobbyist would have in the lab, so or you know, have in their shack. So you probably never heard of it or even understood what it could do because it was just way out of the league of uh, you know, what we'd even talk about. So like I said, professional units can cost thousands or more. And there's gonna be a lot of acronyms that we talk about when, when you start researching VNAs, you're gonna see all these other acronyms that we're gonna talk about. So let's define a couple of those just so that we'll use them, but then you'll also understand what they are when you start reading up on things. There's a lot of acronyms and symbols and things like that. So one acronym you'll hear is DUT. Anybody know what DUT is? Besides the engineers? Device under tech, under um, test. That's right. Yeah, so that's, that's a device under test. And we're going to talk about a device under test that have one or two ports, one or two connections to the device, right? One thing to remember about a DUT is that it's going to affect the signal that's going through it in some way, shape, or form. It's going to amplify it. It's going to attenuate it. It's going to filter it. It's going to do something. Also, the input impedance of that DUT is going to affect the signal that's applied, right? Because the source has some output impedance. So if it's feeding into some other impedance, the, the voltage applied is going to depend on what that uh, input impedance of that device looks like, right? So these are some of the important properties that... Uh, you know, a, a VNA is used to, to look at. And why do we care? Uh, you may remember the old adage that to get maximum power transfer from some source to some load, we want the resistance of the source to match the resistance of the load, right? So we want, if we have a 50 ohm output impedance of a transmitter, we want the load to be 50 ohms to get maximum power transfer. Now, in the more general sense, we'll just throw it up here, is that, you know, oftentimes the, uh, load impedance is not going to be a pure resistive value. It's going to have some reactive component to it. Uh, and then even the source could have some reactive component to it. So in order to get the maximum power transfer, we actually want the uh, source and load to match in what's called a complex conjugate, where the resistance is the same, but the reactive component is the same value, but of the opposite sign. Okay. So I just throw it out there because you'll see that when you start looking at things, but and you'll hear this term complex conjugate. That's all it means. Okay, so if I've got, uh, you know, so many ohms of uh, inductive reactants on the source, I want to have so many ohms of capacitive reactants on the load to match that properly to get maximum power transfer. And this is part of the, if you've got an antenna transmatch in your lab or in your, in your ham shack or something like that, and you're adjusting to get maximum, you know, lowest SWR, maximum power out, you're actually creating a complex conjugate match to the impedance looking into the coax. That's really what it's doing. Okay. So when we talk about RF, we like to talk about signals as waves. Okay. And we want to think about those waves in terms of magnitude, in terms of how big that wave is, or we talk about it in phase. Now, a lot of people can get confused by phase, but all phase is, is effectively a delay. You know, is, are the peaks and troughs of the signal lined up? or they shifted one way or the other. That's all phases, right? So here I've got about a 90 degree phase shift where I've got the peak of this signal is lined up about, not, not quite exactly with the zero uh, of this signal. So a little bit less than a 90 degree phase shift between these two signals. But in RF, we think about signals with about their magnitude and phase. So again, if we've got a, uh, a source that's applying an RF signal to the input of a device, it could be an antenna, it could be a filter, it could be an amplifier, okay? It's gonna apply a signal that's gonna go you know, right into the input. 
Now, of course, there's going to be, uh, ideally, if this is an amplifier or a filter or just a hunk of coax, we're going to get some amount of transmission through that device. Okay, makes sense. And if the impedance of the input of that DUT isn't a match to the transmission line impedance or the source impedance uh, or, or is not a complex conjugate match, we're going to get a reflection off of that port and that some of that signal is going to bounce back and go back towards the source, right? Now, of course, this signal, when it adds up with this signal, creates standing waves, and we talk about standing wave ratio, okay? But there, we can measure, essentially, what that reflection is. So that's part of what a VNA does, is it can measure the transmission and reflection properties of a DUT in response to an RF input, okay? So again, that DUT reflection and transmission, and that's going to alter not only the magnitude of the signal, right? The magnitude of this reflection may be much lower than the signal that's being injected into it if the match is close. But the phase of that could be out of phase of, of the signal coming in, depending again on what the complex impedance is. Same thing as the, for the transmission, we could actually alter the phase of the signal due to delay and other properties of the device itself. So the de device is going to alter the magnitude and phase of the source signal, okay, going in both directions. So why do we talk about this? Let's, let's talk about what the basic VNA is. So this green box is kind of what the basic VNA looks like. All right, we've got a source that's providing an RF signal that ultimately is coming down and going into our device. Okay, and then the output of the device is coming back and being measured. Okay, so inside the VNA, we have a set of directional couplers. And what the directional couplers do, they're kind of special little RF circuits that can sample a signal going in one direction and not the other. So, so for example, we've got a directional coupler here that samples the signal that's being transmitted to our device, and that's being sampled and measured in this reference receiver. That's what the R stands for. It's, it's a referencing. That's, this is what I'm applying to my device. And now any signal that's reflected off of the input and then comes back can get sampled by this other directional coupler, which measures only, which samples off only the signal that's coming back in the other direction. And we call that A, okay, or A receiver, okay. Uh, on the, on the, in this particular case, we don't have a set of directional couplers or a source on the other port. Uh, more expensive VNAs do, but the nano VNA doesn't. So it's only going to measure what comes through here. So I don't have any, I don't have a need for a directional coupler in this case. I'm just going to measure what comes through our DUT. So the receivers essentially measure both the magnitude and phase of the signal in each of these locations. And then we'll pass those results up to you know, some compute engine, whether it's a microcontroller or uh, a PC that's connected to it or the instrument itself to essentially go and compute uh, the results. All right, and what results do we wanna compute? Well, first thing we'll take a look at is transmission properties. And these are based on the ratio of the signal received in the B receiver compared to what is being transmitted in the R receiver. So essentially B over R. And that's essentially a measure of the gain or loss of the DUT, right? Because if the, if the DUT was an amplifier that uh, had a gain of two, right? Then our, we'd have a, a gain of two because our B over R would be, you know, two over one, for example, right? Um, you'll also hear that term called S21. We'll talk about S parameters in a minute. Uh, so S21 is another measure essentially of that insertion loss or gain. You also maybe hear the term transmission coefficient. It's literally this, a same name for, you know, the, the same, a different name for the same property. But then we'll also maybe talk about insertion phase or group delay. And that, that's a measure of the delay uh, through that device under test. Okay. But then we've also got a measure of the reflection properties, right? Anything that's reflected off that input port comes back and is measured in the A receiver. So our reflection properties are based on A to R, right? A over R. You see that here. And that's, you know, one of the things you can compute from that is the, is the VISWAR, right? Voltage standing wave ratio, which is what, you know, a lot of hams will think about that. RF engineers will think more about, instead of the VSWR, they'll talk about something called the reflection coefficient, okay, also known as S11 or S22, but we'll talk about, again, what these mean in a minute. Um, sometimes they'll talk about it in terms of return loss, 
you know, return loss can, can really be thought of as just the inverse of the reflection coefficient. Uh, or the reflection properties can also tell us what the input impedance is of our device. So we can actually measure that. Okay, so that's kind of the basic job of a VNA. Now again, most professional VNAs are going to have a source and couplers like these guys right here on this port as well. So we can measure reverse transmission and the output impedance of a device, as well as the input impedance and the forward transmission or gain. So most VNAs have that, that source and couplers and receivers on both sides. But this you know, super cheap nano VNA is what we call a two port, one path. It has two ports and can measure one path. So it's called a two port, one path analyzer. Okay, everybody still with me? Looks like we are. Okay. All right, so what's a VNA good for? So on, on just making measurements with just a single port, we can look at reflection properties. So this can tell us, again, the SWR or visoir of an antenna system, okay? The complex input impedance of a device. If we built a filter or something like that, we wanna make sure the input impedance is what we expect it to be. We can measure components, resistors, inductors, and capacitors. And what's important here, especially with inductors and capacitors, is that we can measure them versus frequency. So we can make sure that we're not above the self-resident frequency of the device, that it really is operating properly. And sometimes really small capacitors or really you know, small inductors are tough to measure with these little handheld meters because they don't have enough resolution to get down there because they test at a relatively low frequency. A VNA can test them at a higher frequency where it's easier to make the measurement. Um, we could also do things like feed line length. Now it's related to reflections and we'll talk a little bit about that as well because uh, you may know that a, a transmission line is really kind of like an impedance transformer. Uh, if a transmission line, for example, is exactly a quarter wavelength long at the frequency that you're operating at, it does kind of a magical inversion of the, of the impedance. If you had a transmission line, for example, that happened to be exactly a quarter wavelength long and it was open at the far end, at that frequency, at the input end, it looks like a short. And Vice versa, if you had a, a transmission line had, that was shorted at the far end, at a quarter wavelength long, quarter wavelength away, it looks like an open. And at any other length, you just get an impedance transformation. It's kind of like a tuner, if you will. But because of this property and the, these properties of transmission lines, we can actually do some mathematical manipulations inside of VNA to actually compute where that open or short exists. So that kind of gives you a distance default measurement. Okay, so that's, that's something else that can be done. And if, if anybody's got a, uh, an antenna analyzer, like a rig expert or something like that, and one of the things it can do is a distance default, it's actually doing this, this type of measurement. It's actually measuring versus frequency and then figuring out versus frequency when you get this impedance transformation from an open to a short and it can identify where that, how far down the line that is by knowing the propagation velocity or the velocity factor of the coax and the frequency where it made that test. Now, on a two, when you have a two port on the VNA, on that second port, you can measure transmission properties, such as the shape of a filter, right? Because you're measuring versus frequency always, right? So we, we want to sweep the frequency at the input of the filter, and let's look at what comes out the other end. So we can measure the filter shape or loss of a filter. We can look at loss in a feed line, okay, pretty simple. We can look at the delay through some kind of device under test. We can look at amplifier gain and frequency response, okay? So we can measure things like antennas and duplexers and diplexers, filters, inductors, capacitors, amplifiers, splitters, balance, chokes, phasing networks, attenuators. All of these are things that we as you know, radio heads like to play with, right? Sometimes we need to characterize them and test them. So we can do all of that with a VNA. So we mentioned this uh, thing uh, like S11 and S21, they're, they're called S parameters. So, so what are S parameters? You know, people get scared off by the name, but it, they're really, it's really a pretty simple concept. They're called scattering parameters. That's where the letter S comes from, but that still doesn't tell you much. So it's really just a ratio of a measured response to a stimulus, okay? And they, the, the two numbers following the S refer to where we're measuring the response and where, we've met, where the stimulus came from or, be, or was being applied. So for example, um, the SXY is the response 
measured at port X as a result of the stimulus applied to port Y. Okay, so if this is port one, S11 is the response at port one in response to the stimulus coming from port one. So that's the reflection, right? So our, the signal being applied is going here. The signal is coming back is our reflection, okay? And so that, so that would be an S11 measurement, okay? So, so here's that example here. So I've got S11 is the ratio of A to R, right? Because R is what's being applied. A is what's reflecting back. That ratio is S11. Pretty simple. It's just reflection at the DUT port, okay? S22 would be, if I had that source over here on port two, it would just be the reflection off of port two, okay? S21 is a measure of the B signal coming into port two in response to the R signal coming from port one, okay? So, that, so that's why it's called S21. It's a response at port two due to the stimulus applied to port one. And it's this ratio of B to R. And again, R being the applied signal, which is, again, we can consider that as a reference. So that's really all S parameters are. And so if you look at them and say, oh, well, that's not so bad. And generally we're gonna, S parameters are essentially complex values. They have a magnitude and a phase, right? Because the DUT can alter the magnitude and the phase. But most of the time when we're talking about S parameters, all we care about is the magnitude of it. And generally we're gonna represent it as the log magnitude. It's just because there's a lot of dynamic range involved, we typically convert it to a logarithmic uh, thing, just like using dB and dBm on a spectrum analyzer. We convert the S parameter magnitude to a log, a log dB value, log magnitude value. Okay. So one other little wrinkle and complication when using a VNA that is a little bit different is that you generally have to apply a user calibration. You might say, well, hey, I bought this instrument, it's calibrated, why, don't, why do I need to calibrate it again? And the reason is a user calibration does a number of things that a factory calibration can't do. Number one is we're dealing with generally a pretty large measurement dynamic range. Uh, so of course, careful calibration can get rid of that, but you wanna get the most out of it. We're gonna do a local calibration. We're gonna talk about why in a moment. But also, we're also because we're making a phase measurement, right? If I've, if I've got a device that I wanna test, I've got to connect up to that through some coax or something like that to get to the instrument itself. So there's some delay associated with just that connection. I might want to, I might want to remove that from the measurement and establish a measurement plane right at the device ports and ignore what happened in of the delay going up to that point. Okay, so part of the user calibration is to establish that measurement plane at your device and ignore the connections up to it. Okay, the factory calibration can't do these things. Okay, so what it corrects for are what we call systematic errors. And these are uh, the source and receiver frequency response, um, the source and load mismatch, the leakage and directivity of those uh, couplers that are inside the VNA, as well as all the user cables and fixtures. So we're essentially making the measurement right at our device ports. Okay. So, and generally you've got to redo or reinitiate that user calibration whenever there's a configuration change. I changed the fixture, I've changed the frequency that I'm testing or something like that. You got to run another quick user calibration. And it's a very simple process. I actually did a video on it. We won't go through it here now, but it's just a matter of connecting up a couple of standards like an open, a short and a load um, and, and going through the routine in the analyzer to establish that user calibration to correct for these various inherent errors inside the instrument, your connection issues, uh, and establish that measurement plane at your device, okay? So what are, what, when we look at a VNA, what kind of displays are we gonna get? As we talked about, all the measurements generally out of a VNA are made versus frequency, with the exception of doing like a distance default measurement on a, uh, um, you know, on a cable or something, but it starts off as a frequency measurement and is computed to time domain. But anyway, most of the measurements are made versus frequency. Reflection coefficient or S11, again, is typically represented by log magnitude. Um, and it's generally gonna be zero, meaning you've got you know, a really bad impedance match and everything's reflected or some negative number. 
uh, because you, you're reflecting back something smaller than the input. Um, if you're measuring SWR, it's typically the simple linear ratio that you typically see on an SWR meter or a, uh, an antenna analyzer, you know, 1.5 to 1, 2.3 to 1, et cetera. And it'll be plotted that way versus frequency. Um, complex impedance, we can look at input impedance and things like that of a device. That's generally going to be represented on a Smith chart. I've got a couple of videos on a Smith chart, so we won't go into the details of that, but that's typically how it's going to be represented um, on the VNA. Um, and also the, well, the transmission coefficient, S21, again, being an S parameter, we're generally looking at log magnitude of that. And then if we're looking at phase, insertion delay, or group delay, that's typically a linear measurement as well, uh, you know, in, in degrees or, uh, or something like that. Okay. So now we'll talk about the nano VNA. Now that you're an expert and know what a VNA is, let's talk about this nano VNA. Uh, there's a lot of history to it. It originally appeared in a magazine in like 2016. Um, it was kind of a, a little project that was published and uh, some people picked up on it. And eventually we had a developer that, that developed a product and made it open source uh, about a year and a half, two years ago um, and came out with kind of an original variant of it that had a pretty small display. It was like a 2.8 inch diagonal display. So it was really pretty small. It was uh, you know, maybe a, you know, about the size, maybe a little bit smaller than a credit card, okay, in terms of the display size. Uh, but again, also, but still pretty cheap, right? So the original one had this really tiny display, and it did, didn't even have a case on it. It just had the display was bolted down to a board, and then had another board with a microcontroller on it, another board with the RF stuff on it, and then like a metal plate or a plastic plate on the top and bottom, and that was it. So Shortly after that, some people made a design a case for it and started selling it. And then the Chinese picked up on it and just started selling variants of it all over the place. There was a guy whose name begins with H who kind of did a little bit of a hardware redesign. And his design is probably the most popular one that's out there. Uh, and that, and so he, he kind of did a variant of it in the, with this 2.8 display. Later produced a unit with a 4-inch display called the H4. And that's actually the one that I have here. It's a Nano VNA H4. If you if you can look at the camera, you can kind of see it says Nano VNA H4. Look at my video thing there, right? Um, and then there's another variant with a four-inch display that is a dash F, like a, a Nano VNA dash F. Uh, a, little, a different developer. It wasn't the same guy. So a little bit of a hardware difference. Um, the difference with that one primarily is that the case, instead of being a molded plastic case, is a metal case. And some people might prefer that, but it costs about twice as much as the H4. But I don't think the, the performance is a little better, but not dramatically better. Okay. Uh, as Al mentioned earlier, there's a, uh, or uh, was it Al or uh, Bob or somebody mentioned earlier that there's now a V2 out. And it's got this unfortunate name, SAA V2, a different developer compared to these guys here. Um, and it looks kind of like this. And this is what I mean. It's kind of, it isn't available with a case yet. It's got like these two boards, one with the display on it. It's got a couple of, the, the port's coming out here and it's just bolted together, but it doesn't have a case on it. So, you, you know, crap can get inside of it and that kind of a thing. But uh, this guy goes up to three gigahertz, whereas like the H4 goes up to one and a half gig. And the, the performance is actually a lot better than the, the unit that I have. And it's still like 60 bucks. It's crazy. But like I said, I'm going to wait a couple of months you know, because eventually some people pick up on this, put a little bit of a bigger display on it, wrap a case around it, and sell it as a better a better looking kit. So I'll, I'll wait till that happens before I, I I spend some money on that one. But and so as of like mid 2020, like right now, <laughs> and this because this is a very quickly changing uh, scenario here. I like the H4. It, there's a lot of people out there that's do, are doing work on it. There's people that are developing firmware updates for it and things like that. It's easy to get. You know, of course, you can go through AliExpress and some of these Chinese manufacturers, but you don't know what you're going to get. But if you go to somebody like um, like R&L Electronics here in the states, they they buy from one manufacturer, and and it's a, you know it's it's not like a cheap knockoff clone. It's got you know the proper shields inside of it and things like that. And again, the V2 has got some better performance and a wider frequency range, but no case yet. So again, I'm I'm in a little bit of a wait and see on the SAA V2 at this point. But, uh, but I'm pretty, I think this, this nano VNA for 60 bucks, man, is pretty amazing. Okay. So a couple more details on it. This is when you buy one, it kind of comes in a nice, nice little box like this with a little molded, uh, you know, plastic insert and that kind of a thing. 
Um, all of them are a two port, one path design. And that's kind of what I'd shown, you know, in that model of VNA where one port has got the source and the couplers coming out and the other side just has a receiver. And that's again, a two port, one path device. Again, the H4 that I have goes from 50 kilohertz up to 1.5 gig. Uh, and it really is, it's got a built-in battery. It's charged over USB, so you can do standalone operation with it. Um, there is a, P, a couple of different versions of some PC software. Since it has the USB port, you can hook it up to the USB, bring it up to your PC, and run the software, which does a lot of nice things for you. I mean, for example, when you're running standalone, the, the number of trace points you get across the screen is 100 or 101 points. So you can't look at a really wide frequency range because if you do, you've got a, a pretty coarse, you know, graduation or resolution of frequency points across the screen. With the software, you can actually break that up and get many, many more points across a given frequency range. And you could have multiple plots all separated from each other instead of all overlaid on top of each other like we have uh, on the standalone. Um, the, this website, simple website, nanovna.com. This is a, kind of the menu you see at the top of the website. It's a pretty sparse, not very graphically oriented website, but th it's just kind of all about information, getting started, how to, how to read the screen, how to calibrate it, and you know the, the various software applications are available. There's a, a user group that's very active. You probably get 20 or 30 emails a day if you sign up to that user group. All, pe all, all people that are asking questions about it and want to go use it and do different things with it. Um, the user interface is actually pretty simple. This is kind of what it looks like turned on here. There's a jog wheel on the top that you can rock back and forth to go up and down in the menus and then you push it to select things in the menu, but it's also a touch screen. So you can touch and tap on the screen. It's not multi-touch, but it'll, you can touch and drag. Like if I wanted to move this marker to make a measurement at a different spot, I can just drag it with my finger or a stylus or something like that. Okay. And it's got a fairly simple menu structure. When you, when you tap anywhere on the screen, the menu will pop up. Or if I push down the jog wheel, the, the start menu pops up. And then you just go from here, like under, if I tap on display, that, that brings us to places where I can turn on or off certain traces, tell what channels those traces are measuring, the format of those traces, whether it's going to be log magnitude or Smith chart or a linear, uh, set the scale, things like that. Then you've got marker menus to add markers and do searches with markers so you can actually make measurements at different uh, frequencies and things. The stimulus tab uh, uh, menu item tells you, was where you can set the start and stop measurement frequencies or set the center and span. You can get, so you can set the frequency range you want to look at either by doing one or the other. And you can see down here at the bottom, it says start at 10 kilohertz and stop at 1500 megahertz. So, and then the calibration process, we mentioned you've got to run a, a user cal that's done through here. And you can, there's, you can recall some and save and recall into uh, like four or five different memory slots, okay? And generally, when you do a calibration, you generally would, would store that into one of the, the memory slots so that you can go back later and pick that up. So maybe I have a memory slot that's just kind of geared towards, you know, 40 meters because I'm playing around with some 40 meter antennas or something like that, right? And then uh, there's a USB port on the top um, or somewhere on it, actually on the bottom of my unit here, that uh, allows you to charge the unit up as well as um, gives you a, an interface to the PC if you want to use some... Uh, you know, use the PC with some of this extra software. A couple of examples here. Here's like, if I wanted to measure an antenna, I essentially connect up the antenna to channel zero. And you can see channel zero is measuring S11. And we could see on the display that, you know, here's my frequency range down here along the bottom. Okay, this was measuring my 40 meter antenna. Okay, 7 meg to 7.3 meg. Uh, Here's the SWR plot. You can see it's kind of this blue trace. So it's, that's the blue trace up here. It says SWR. And then um, you can move a marker around on it if I wanted. So the marker is sitting all the way over here right now at seven megahertz. And at seven megahertz, the SWR of my antenna, because I had, I had the tuner set to be way up high towards the top end of the phone band. It was 4.73 to one, okay, right there. Uh, we also have the reflection coefficient. Okay, the reflection coefficient is a log magnitude of essentially S11, and obviously, and that's going to have a dip, a minimum, right at the re at the resonant point here. So this allows you to relate the SWR to to the um, reflection coefficient. 
So again, that marker at the same frequency here, that's sitting at minus 3.71. So a, a minus 3.7 uh, dB reflection coefficient corresponds to a 4.73 to 1 SWR. And then the, this little curve here relates to the Smith chart. That's all these little circular arcs that you see. Uh, and on a Smith chart, the very center of the screen, right where I've got my little laser pointer here, that represents uh, essentially the system impedance, which in most cases is 50 ohms. That would represent a perfect match, okay? And then as you go this direction on the center axis, you go higher in resistance, and down here is lower in resistance. If you go above the line, you're adding inductive reactance, and down below the line is capacitive reactance. So we can see that the over this frequency range, the antenna goes from, in this case, at the low frequency end, where that marker is, I'm sitting at an inductive reactance here. Okay, it looks like 16 ohm, 16.4 uh, ohms with 822 nanohenries of inductance at this point. As the frequency goes up, we reach a point where we cross right through, you know, my 50 ohm point. That's actually this point in frequency, and then we keep going and we get a little bit capacitive on the antenna. So if we move the marker around, you'd be able to see the, how all those things are related. So we can see the SWR complex impedance and reflection coefficient. And it's kind of handy having this S the Smith chart up. Once you get used to it, if you're adjusting your antenna tuner, as you adjust the you know, transmitter and antenna uh, you know, capacitors and things like that, you can watch this curve move in different directions. And after a while, you get a feel for, hey, adjusting this way moves the curve in that direction. So you can actually get pretty efficient in tuning the antenna by watching how the complex impedance changes on the Smith chart, knowing that you want to target it getting right here you know, at the, uh, the center of the chart. So that's you know, measuring an antenna. And that's probably the most common thing that most hams would be doing with a VNA. You know, instead of using an antenna analyzer, which costs $300, you can get a $60 VNA and do a better job. Okay. So how about if I had a filter I wanted to measure? Maybe I had a low pass filter I was gonna put in to make sure I don't have you know, TVI anymore or something like that. So that connects up to the two ports here. And again, here's my frequency range shown down at the bottom. In this case, I swept this, this filter that I did um, uh, this with. It was actually a, a low pass filter that I had designed to go with a, a little CW transmitter called a Michigan Mighty Mite, which uses a color burst crystal uh, as a transmit frequency. So 3.5 uh, megahertz, 3.57 megahertz. So this uh, filter was designed to get rid of the harmonic distortion out of that transmitter. Okay, so I was sweeping it over one meg to 15 meg frequency range. Okay, so, uh, so here's the insertion loss right here. And this is the log magnitude of S21. So I can see at low frequencies at one megahertz, it was sitting pretty close to zero, meaning that the signal was going right through it, very little attenuation. And as we work my way up in frequency, okay, we start to get, start to roll off. So I can actually see that filter shape. Okay, that's what the insertion loss shows me. Okay, I also have the SWR shown here. So I can see I've got a nice low SWR looking into that filter until I start rolling off and then it starts rocketing up. And then I've also got the reflection coefficient, again, which is the log magnitude of S11. And I can see I've got, you know, I'm down, you know, minus eight, minus 10 dB, you know, or so. And that again corresponds to a low SWR. And then as we go past the corner frequency, then we get to the point where essentially all of that energy is reflected and not going through the filter. So that's why, that's one of the ways it keeps that energy from getting out to the antenna if I was using this as a, a filter on that uh, little Michigan Mighty Might CW transmitter. And then of course, we've got the input impedance. You know, I could have just turned, you could turn those traces off, but it was just kind of fun to see kind of the spiraling input impedance of that, uh, of the filter, okay. Now let's say I want to measure coax length. Uh, in this case, it uses a function in the analyzer called a time transform, where it actually sweeps over a frequency range that you define, and it, it does a transform internally to convert that to time. And because of, if I've got a coax that's open at the end, it can tell from the reflections that it gets back over frequency how long that line is through this transform. And you get a plot that's like this, and if you put the marker on there, that marker showing me that this cable was, you know, 9.13 meters long or about 24, 25 feet long, okay? Now this could also be used to measure, you know, the distance to a fault. Let's say I had a, a piece of coax going up a tower and all of a sudden my SWR goes crazy or something, I, or things not working right, you suspect that, 
either the, the cable's got a break in it somewhere, or maybe it's got a, a short in it somewhere, right? Uh, you can use this to actually measure where that abrupt change in impedance is, where that fault is, and then you know how far you got to climb up the tower to go fix it, right? You could also measure, um, you know, if I connected up the end of the coax back to this end here, then we can go back to our frequency domain measurement and measure essentially the loss of the coax over frequency. Okay. So quick summary on the, on the nano VNA. You know, it's kind of the RF tool or toy of the year, you know, for 60 bucks, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, costs less than, uh, you know, going out to dinner. So it's, uh, you know, kind of a neat, neat, neat toy for, uh, for what it is really just amazing capability for about $60. There's just a ton of videos that are available, you know, on YouTube and things like that. Admittedly, most of them are crap. So you got to go searching to find the ones that are, uh, are actually useful. Um, I've got a couple on my site. Uh, there's a very, very active user group that are always answering a lot of questions for folks. And again, a good US source for one of these things is uh, R&L Electronics. And it's just, that's their website is rndl.com. So thank you again for that. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, let me know. Yeah, very good, Alan. Uh, I have the, uh, the, the first uh, little one that came out. Yeah. And, uh, I tell you, I, I was really uh, quite surprised. Uh, I'm more accustomed to uh, my favorite display is a Smith display. Yeah. So uh, you know, I shut the other ones off because okay. <laughs> it was like too busy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I characterized a, a couple of things I had around here, and uh, I had built, um, you know, of course, when I worked at Fort Mammoth, uh, we had all the instrumentation. Sure, yeah. And uh, and I, uh, they had an, an old relic, uh, the HP uh, 8953, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Just pushed into a corner, and I said, could I move it to my bed? Yeah, it doesn't work right. Well, it worked fine. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I, I was hoping that eventually it would like go towards the dumpster and, uh, you know, but anyway, it didn't, you know, looks like, it, looks like Neville gra when he grabbed it. So, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, well, anyway, uh, I had built the N2PK. Um, it was a uh, kid, all surface mount parts. It only goes to 60 megahertz. Use the okay. PC. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, that was good, you know, for certain things. Sure. Oh, uh, I don't know if you saw this guy yet. Um, I just got this. It's a, a little demo oh, oh, board. A little demo board. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like 18 bucks. I don't know if it's, you know, it uses these real, real tiny push on coax yeah. connector. Yeah. And I, I tell you, I tried. <laughs> little UFI connectors, I think they're called. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. What, you know, I mean, I, I didn't want to like mash the connector. Yeah. But the tiny connectors, you yeah, know, yeah. but it, it's cool because um, it has different components um, and um, it shows a typical response. Right. Right. That, that you would get. And then of course, in the back is a Smith chart. Yeah. But uh, yeah, cool. very cool. I, in, I, uh, I enjoyed your uh, presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, like I said, pretty cool thing. Like I said, I know, you know, a lot of you guys are hams. Not everybody is, um, but uh you know, you may have a need to, you know, characterize a component, test a coil, you know, measure a capacitor, you know, do things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's cheaper than even a handheld LCR meter is well over a hundred dollars, you know, so something like this and you build yourself a little fixture to plug parts into it and you've got a, an LCR meter that uh, for less money that actually gives you more insight than an LCR meter does. So, yeah. It's a cool yeah, little, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, when you think, uh, like the, uh, well, the HP instrumentation, like you said, you know, 30,000 up, you yeah, know. Right, exactly. And of course, uh, uh, well, Tektronics, do they, uh, I don't know if I remember working with any of their. Well, uh, yeah, Tech, tech had, had really, I mean, never really had any VNAs until just a few years ago. And the only VNAs that right. Tech has right now is that the one that I showed on the one of the earlier slides there that, um, was a just a USB based analyzer, but it's got it's like 120 dB dynamic range, goes up to six yeah. gig, and it's like ten thousand dollars. So it's a, an, in, an inexpensive, you know, kind of uh, you know low yeah. cost VNA for the masses type thing. So, but that's all that we have. So, you know, unlike you know Rody and HP Agilent Keysight, uh, we don't have a huge variety of yeah. them, so. 
Well, there's, this there's... is uh, this is great for what it is, and uh, I'll tell you, it opens up. Uh, you know, it, when when you really, of course, work with it for a while, and I and I did, you know, work with the network analyzer for quite a sure. while. But yeah. you know, when I was at Fort Monmouth, right. was, it was always something that had to be uh, matched. Yeah. Uh, so so Joe asked a question on chat. Um, you know, talk a little bit about how this could be used to test if a capacitor is good. Um, and so certainly you can use it to actually test the value, the measured value of the capacitor at whatever operating frequency that capacitor is, is seeing. Like for example, it's being, if it's being used in a coupling stage in an IF and you know that IF is at 455 kilohertz, you can test it at 455 kilohertz. So, but, so it'll show you the value, but it'll also show you, um, you know, the ser equivalent series resistance of the uh, of the capacitor. Uh, it's essentially a measure of loss and things like that. You'll see that in the complex impedance. It won't be able to show you things like leakage, unfortunately. Um, so no tester can kind of show you everything. Um, but, uh, but it does give you a way of actually testing the capacitor at the frequencies where they're actually used. So in that sense, you know, a capacitor might look good when you test it at 10 kilohertz, but doesn't look so good when you test it at, uh, at 500 kilohertz or something like that. So uh, it all depends on, you know, if something kind of went, you know, went awry in that cap. So it's another tool, but uh, no one single tool can kind of be completely go and no go because there's, a, there's so many different parameters to measure, you know, value, ESR, leakage, you know, lost tangent, things like that. So, um, but it, it's, it's one way of looking at things. So I hope that yeah. answers your question a little bit. It would be for small value capacitors too, not large yeah. value, like electrolytics and stuff. Yeah, the electrolytics and the, you know, big, you know, large, you know, 10, 10, 100 microfarad caps, that's kind of not where you're going to be using a VNA because typically those caps, are, that's well beyond the self-resident frequency of those caps anyway, so. Exactly. Now, there, there's more product. things you can do with one of these things. You can use them as a signal generator, probably sweep an IF in a television set. Uh, sure. Can you yeah, think out of the box a little more for us and show sure. us some other neat stunts we can do with these things? Well, you certainly, yeah, you, you say, well, because you can put it into a, like a CW frequency mode so it doesn't sweep. So in a sense, it's a signal generator. However, what you have to remember with this cheap nano VNA, the output is not a sine wave. The output's actually a square wave. <laughs> so it's like a digital output. Now, of course, if you set it to, you know, to 30 megahertz, it's going to give you a 30 megahertz square wave which means you're gonna have energy primarily at the odd harmonics. So I'll have energy at 30 megahertz, at 90 megahertz, at 120 megahertz. <laughs> There's gonna be energy at all those other frequencies. But if you're testing you know, an IF, who cares? But you also don't have any control over the output power unless you put attenuators in line. Okay, so you're kind of stuck with how much power it puts out and you're stuck with the fact that it actually puts out a square wave. But, um, but it could be used as a, a signal generator for situations where you don't care about that, right? Because if you think about a square wave, it's basically just energy at the fundamental you know, frequency and then energy at the odd harmonics. And if your signal is gonna reject those harmonics, then you don't worry about it. But you also have to remember like this guy will go up to, um, the square wave will go up to 300 megahertz. When you, this, th but this unit can go to 1.5 gig. How does it do that? It actually uses those harmonics and measures the harmonic energy. So if I set it to 301 megahertz, it actually puts out a one megahertz signal. <laughs> okay, and uh, and well, actually, I'll, actually, the 301 will be 301 divided by three. Okay, because it uses the, the odd harmonic, the third harmonic, then it uses the fifth harmonic to get up from above three, 300 meg. It uses the odd harmonics to get up to 900, and then odd harmonics again to get up to 1200 and 1500. Okay. So, um, so it's not a pure signal source where better VNAs, you know, that cost more than 60 bucks, <laughs> you know, will, uh, will give you something that's more sinusoidal output. Okay. But yeah, there, I guess, and, and you're right, Neville, there's, there's really a lot of things if you use your imagination that you can actually do with these things. I just kind of wanted to wet your whistle a little bit, but certainly sweeping the IF of a, of a radio, of a, of a transmitter, uh, or actually me, a television or anything like that you can certainly go ahead and do that with this because, and the only thing you've got to worry about or think about sometimes is that the output impedance is 50 ohms and it's expecting 50 ohms. And if, you know, an IF stage, the input to an IF filter may not be 50 ohms. Like if it's a crystal filter or something like that, it might be a few hundred or a few thousand ohms. 
So you, in order to really get a really accurate response to that filter, you really have to do some impedance matching to get from 50 to whatever that impedance is. But in some cases, you don't care if you just want to see if it's kind of close. Um, if you don't get the impedance match right, then the filter flatness might not be right you know, in terms of what it really is in the application. But, it, but you could still kind of see if it's doing anything at all, if it's filtering or if it's, or if it's just, or if it's broken or something. So, but uh, yeah, there's, if you think about what, what it does, and that's why I wanted to kind of go by in terms, you know, tell you about what's going on inside the box, that gives you an, I can give you an idea of, well, gee, if I've got a box that's doing this, it's sweeping that and it's measuring this, what else could I use that for? It's really kind of, uh, you know, hopefully make some light bulbs go off in terms of how you could use it. Yeah, that's one of the neat things about it, um, Alan. Was the um, was another another neat video would be uh, for you to put up would be uh, test fixturing for these things because I use mine. Mm -hmm. I've used it quite often for uh, for setting up traps and coils in antennas. Yeah, that that you know that's a, that's one that's a good one, Bruce. I mean, it's something I actually have some folks have asked me about and you know how to properly fixture up to measure you know a trap or a common mode choke or something like that and um, you know. I, so I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about that one, but if anybody knows my, my video creation process, there's a lot of noodling that happens <laughs> before I actually create a video. So that's one that I'm noodling on. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also been thinking about doing one to fixture up to measure resistors, capacitors, and things like that, and be able to easily calibrate that fixture out and make measurements at higher frequencies. Um, so that's kind of one that's kind of in the works that I'll hopefully do in the next couple of weeks. But uh, it's tough to kind of mix doing uh, the video production with uh, a real job. <laughs> There's a funny work thing that gets in there because I find it really useful for uh, for particularly putting traps and antennas because now I know not just where the trap is operating but also know the time in the, in the trap. Yeah, so I yeah, that, one of the yeah, I, yeah. I'd really be interested to see what you've done in terms of fixturing to do some effective measurements that way too. So crude, very crude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've found that you can put a three or four turn loop on the uh, on the. Uh, the uh, channel zero connector and use it as a kind of like a calibrated grid dip meter. There you go. Uh, it actually does work. It, mm -hmm. You, you got to look at it into the into the decibel kind of thing, full scale. But you can indeed see a resonance on a tuned circuit that's yeah. not directly connected to the unit. You can use this to find where the front end of a radio lines by uh, yeah. getting close to the ferrite of the antenna. You can see where that first stage is tuned, yeah. and then you know where the local oscillator is with your scope, and then you can pull off a, a tracking job on nice. a radio with it. So they're all kind of weird things you can do yeah. with these things. I know, it's just I, an I, astounding I, I, device. I don't, yeah, I don't, I just don't want to make my, my poor little Heathkit grid dip meter cry if I did that, so. <laughs> hey, it doesn't pull when you run across the tune circuit. <laughs> right, there you go. I, I was just playing with the, an old measurements of 59 megacycle meter. Okay. That, that That's probably one of the, the best grid dip meters. I had met, uh, the engineer he passed away, old timer Jerry Minter, some hmm. years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, yesterday I was playing with this little uh, circuit. Uh, the whole thing came up about AM transmitters. Okay. Uh, and this is just cobbled together. Uh, I first tried a transistor, but I could I couldn't get even though the tuned circuit you know was set for broadcast band, it was oscillating you know, like 20 megahertz or something. Yeah. So then I figured, you know what, because uh, I have all sorts of parts here, let me put in a J310 and a, a simple like Armstrong circuit. Okay. And it took off right away. I didn't put any biasing or anything. The only problem uh, is that instead of putting out uh, like a megahertz broadcast band, it's putting out 250 kilohertz. Uh, like... <laughs> You know, a really negative going pulse. Yeah. And the harmonics, of course, the fifth harmonic, you know, goes into the broadcast band. Yeah. No no problem at all. But um, I have to play around with the, uh, it was just, you know, tinkering yeah. and yeah. Uh, bias the FET. Because right now, you know, it's it's just uh, uh, it's just switching. And I guess yeah. at that part of the waveform, you know, bringing the, uh, the tune circuit. Right. Now, if anybody's on your Zoom interface, if you switch from gallery view to speaker view, you'll get a kind of a bigger view of the video here. But uh, cause I figured I'd show you this because this is one thing actually, I wound up doing this for work. Uh, well, this is, this is a fixture that I was using to measure components. Um, so if, uh, let's see where, so you probably see this here. And basically it's just a, a, a two SMA connectors. And I got just a couple of pin sockets on here. 
to stick components in to measure either you know the value of the component or through you know through a device you know, to measure loss and things like that. So this was just a very simple little thing for measuring small leaded components. But on the same board, I had something I had to actually had to use for work here. I had to actually build a test signal to to demonstrate an instrument to a customer actually this afternoon, and they needed to modulate the amplitude of that signal over a very slow range. And I didn't have a way of doing that with the signal generator I have here. So the other side of this board has got a, a little surface mount pin diode in it. And I just put a couple of resistors there and a place to hook up a power supply. And I was able to send the signal through this and adjust the bias through the pin diode to basically do a little pin diode modulator. I was able to modulate the amplitude of the signal with this thing bolted onto the front of my $130,000 signal generator. So <laughs> use this today uh, to help demonstrate an instrument. But these are the kind of little fixture type things that I would often build, you know, for, you know, my, you know, that I think are going to be neat little accessories for, you know, for this, for measuring small little components. We'd have to get a little bit bigger and a little bit more creative when we start measuring things like traps and chokes and things like that, like Bruce was talking about. Alan, yeah. How um, how would you use this to measure the IF selectivity or passband of a um, a vintage receiver without zapping this thing, without zapping it? Yeah, Good I'm question. talking about a tube yep. receiver. Oh yeah. So first thing you'd probably want to do is, you know, why well, I always recommend if you can get like a stage away. Like if you got an amplifier on either side of the the, the tune circuit try to get on the other side of that amplifier so that you, the loading of the, of the device doesn't affect the tuning of, the, of that filter. Uh, certainly decoupling caps on either side to isolate the DC. Um, and then on the, so on the flying lead side of, that capa of those cap coupling capacitors, maybe you know, a, a, a resistor to ground, a couple hundred ohms to ground so that you don't get any DC coming through those caps when you hook up the device. And then you can, you know, so you, you essentially have, you know, your circuit, just tack in a couple of, of capacitors that are gonna give you a low enough reactance at the frequency you're testing. At the other end, you know, a couple hundred ohms to ground, just to be sure you don't get any DC leakage, you know, stray DC when you, you know, that is sitting there. Cause if, if the bias of the, you know, that line is sitting at, you know, 50 or 60 volts or something like that, you just hook up the cap, you might that cap might not you know might have that 50 or 60 volts there until you load it but if we intentionally load it with a resistor we can get rid of that dc okay. that's on there so now i can hook up my my vna safely there um you may choose to put some resistance in series to try to you know in, increase the impedance because remember the vna has got 50 ohm input and output impedance you can put a couple of hundred ohms in series because all you're looking for is the bandpass shape you're not really going to look necessarily at you know the um, you know the insertion loss or something like that. So you could afford to have some loss there, uh, with the with the you know another couple of hundred ohms or a few k ohms or something like that, depending on the frequency you're operating at, and then sweep it. And then you should be able to get a pretty accurate picture of the shape, you know, and look at uh, rejection and things like that and the shape of that filter. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions for Alan? Listen, Alan, uh, advertise your channel, please. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, maybe the easiest thing is I'll show it to you because I want to show you some. I'll show you some of the neat things. Let me go back to sharing here. Let's go share this page again. And what I'll do is I'll I'll hop out of this site that we're looking you enjoyed at here. this I'll look at right uh, third my, order intermodulation my distortion page here. Stop this from playing. So this is so it looks like this this oddball thing here, YouTube channel, whatever. But if you if you literally just do youtube.com slash w two a e w, you get to my YouTube channel page here. Okay, and one reason I wanted to show it to you here is because uh, you know. Obviously, all the, I've got my most recent videos here, you can see are all about the nano VNA. Uh, they're all serially numbered, so I'm at number 316 here. If you click on this videos link here, this will kind of give you a, a list of all of the videos that I have and you can walk all the way through them. Of course, there's a lot there. I do have videos arranged in some playlists, like I've got a playlist I'm starting for the nano VNA. It's got five videos in it now. I've got other you know, playlists for other topics. 
but probably the more important thing is way over here, you see this link here says a video index file. It's a PDF file. Lower right-hand corner of the banner graphic on the, on the page. If you click on that, it opens up this PDF file that has all of my videos listed by number. Okay, first at the very beginning of it. And you can search all of these. So you just, if you type in like if you do a, and, and you can actually do a control S or a control F or something, control F and then type in something like if I type in radio, I got 77 matches for radio and I can you know, go through and find say, oh, this one here, my QRP go kit backpack for the radio, that's a link. I can click on that, it goes right to that video, okay? So the first part of this index file is just a list of every video sequentially. The second part of it kind of goes by topic. And this made a lot more sense when I had about 50 or 60 videos up, but <laughs> that's still the way it is now. So oscilloscope topics, uh, and then spectrum analyzer topics, other test equipment topics, some test procedures topics, uh, circuit construction, uh, and then I've got basic circuit theory on different things and electronics theory, uh, differential amplifiers, diodes, pin diodes, directional couplers, op amps, transistors, circuit analysis. These are all different videos and they're just kind of arranged by these various topics. I've got some radio specific things here. I've got a little series that I did on the Drake 2B receiver I did some work on. Uh, a lot of it is more ham radio related stuff and then just miscellaneous uh, videos. But, um, but I maintain this index each time I update a new video, I update this file. You can always find it in that same spot, you know, right here in the video index. Or if you go to the about screen here where it says about, click on that. Um, down here, there's also the link to that video index file as well. Okay, but that's where you find my channel, just uh, youtube.com slash W2AEW. You don't need to, you don't have to put the user piece in here. You know, you could just, uh, you could just put uh, W2AEW right here at the end of youtube.com and that brings you right to the channel. Okay, and there's a little introductory video that plays here that I'm stopping so you don't have to watch that, but it just shows, uh, oh, it shows me uh, on my scope as a video monitor. Can you show where the video index is again? Sure, uh, on my main page, you got this banner graphic going across the top. It's all the way over in the lower right-hand corner. There's a link for it. It might be hidden by where if, if you're, the, the videos of everybody might be way over on, on your display right now. So you might not be able to see that. The other place is if along this menu along here in the middle where it says about, if you click on about, then scroll down slightly, you see this link that's right here. I, you know, so I've got a link to people who might want to donate to me, um, but uh, this is the important one here. That, that's the link to that uh, PDF file. All right, so Alan, have a, a question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, be it uh, the, the times we're living in, uh, and you being a, a VEC, I'm seeing and hearing more and more with the younger members and just people in general who want to uh, uh, take their tests. Yep. Uh, what can you add to that? Uh, what are the possibilities of, uh, of online testing? I know that some, uh, some amateur radio clubs, I believe one in uh, Georgia, that is actually giving uh, tests in a parking lot. Yep. And, so uh, you, you assemble there, but go ahead. Yeah, so there's a couple of VE teams in New Jersey that are doing that. I don't know if you know Drew Moore, W2OU, but um, th he's been doing a couple up in Clark, New Jersey, uh, and they're being done outdoors. I, I participated in one about uh, three weeks ago and we did it all outdoors. Uh, what we had done, it was in a parking lot. Uh, we had the VEs, you know, kind of sitting, you know, kind of socially isolated, you know, to do all the grading and stuff under a tent. We had all the, all the other VEs that were monitoring what was going on parked on one side of the parking lot. And we had all the, con the candidates parked on the other side of the parking lot. And we spoke to them over uh, a, uh, low power FM wireless microphone radio type thing so they could hear us. Uh, we gave them the option of sitting in a lawn chair in front of their car or sitting in their car. If they sat in their car, they had to agree to, a lot, you know, to not be creeped out if we walked up to them and peeked in to be sure that they weren't uh, you know, looking things up on their cell phone or whatever. But of course, everybody you know, really wasn't doing that. But 
Um, and we ran a session that way. We did actually two sessions that day uh, with a total of like 19 people taking tests. Um, and then they ran one again last week uh, that I didn't participate in and they're actually running it w another one actually tomorrow. Same thing, but the, um, um, the uh, Clark Municipal Building. So Drew W2OU would be the guy to get in ho get a hold of because he's been kind of running these sessions and you know everybody's got gloves and masks and we ask the people who are coming to be masked when they're going to be interacting with us, uh, but we uh, will pass the information back and forth and it's been successful. Everybody's been safe and we're just uh, you know following you know typical guidelines like that, but it's not indoors. Um, you know, like I said, it's either sitting in your car or sitting on a lawn chair in front of your car. Uh, and taking the test like that. Um, so there may be other groups in New Jersey that are doing it as well. Uh, Rhea, uh, who you who know, may, may be aware of some others. Uh, but, um, but I know Drew has been involved, he's involved in several VE teams and, uh, and he's been running those tests up in that up in Clark. What, what is the uh, name of the club up in Clark? I know you're going to ask me that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure because the VE team, so he, the one he's doing tomorrow is a different team than the one was last week. It was a different team from the one before that. So I, so, but the common out, the common thing is Drew. So, so if you just you know, send Drew an email, W2OU, just look him up or I can get his email address to you to send out. Um, but he's, he'd be the person to get a hold of because um, he's been kind of spearheading uh, doing a lot of this because we were backlogged for, for weeks because he, because he does, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the Raritan Valley uh, VE team, Raritan Valley Radio Club VE team uh, that Drew is also a part of, uh, but he's a part of several others too that he, he, he participates in. And um, I think one is TC, um, the uh, Tri-County uh, Club, Tri-County Radio Club. And there's, I think there's a third one that he's involved with. Um, so, uh, but he, you know, send out a note to all the VEs that he works with to say he's having a session. Anybody who's available to please come by to, to, you know, to be a, one of the VEs at the session. Um, but, uh, we can, you know, look up his, uh, his thing. So it looks like I've got another a chat thing here, uh, from Paul, the club in Clark is the Tri-County Radio Association, TCRA, and their, their call is W2LI. And then it's, you know, um, I don't know that Drew's a member of that club or not, but I know he's been working with them and their VE team. Uh, and again, he's uh, W2OU, Drew Moore. Gentlemen, I'm going to sign out. Uh, I, uh, I enjoyed the presentation. Right. Everyone stay well. All right. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Good night. All right. And I, yeah, I see a note from Joe. Um, he's a VE liaison in Maine and ran an exam session with 32 candidates. Wow, that's a big session. <laughs> and uh, had a session in a firehouse engine bay uh, with all the equipment moved outside. Okay, very successful. But yeah, that's a that's a that's a big session. I don't think I've ever done a session that big. Even when we did the uh, the ham cram down at the Trenton Computer Festival, I think the most we had was like 27 or 28 people. So that's a lot of people, Joe. Any other questions for Alan? All right, so I want to officially thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, you, you, you're such an asset to our club and, uh, and uh, just a very nice guy and your presentations are fantastic. Well, I appreciate that. Like I said, to me, I, I felt like these sessions might have been a little bit off topic for, you know, what you guys typically talk about with, uh, with uh, antique radios and such, but I thought there would be enough commonality that uh, you can you'd say, hey, that, that might be interesting to somehow apply, you know, a, a 2020 modern $60 analyzer to a, you know, an 80 year old radio. <laughs> well, the commonality also is, uh, uh, probably half the club members are hams, whether they're active or dormant. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, they do understand these things too. Yeah. And, and, it, and it piques their interest. And it's, it's been piquing their interest enough to have uh, International Marconi Day now and getting uh, into field days. Uh, and, uh, we're, you know, it's a growing interest for us. And, uh, right. and okay. uh, we'd love to have you down at a field day too. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so if there's no other questions, um, we will let you go. But uh, what we will do is uh, we will um, not end the meeting, but for a few minutes, I have a couple of more things I just want to say. Um, I spoke to Jared Brown today, Delaware Valley Historic Radio Club. And he says that uh, the fall show at Kutztown is on for the September 18th and 19th. Okay, so it is 
on. What is not on is the white room uh, auction. That uh, obviously it's just too tight in there and it's, it's just uh, not gonna happen. Um, and again, two weeks, two more weeks as of tomorrow and uh, is our Hamfest uh, tailgate uh, show. So please get your, uh, your reservations for selling in uh, quickly. This way we, we know what, what our mapping is, is there and how many people are gonna have. Um, it's, it's really important. So um, our next meeting is uh, August 14th, and that will also be a Zoom presentation. And we'll have Professor Tom Ferrara, and he will be giving us a presentation on fabulous fakes, having to do with the Phil Weingarten um, uh, debacle um, that uh, went on in the 1960s and 70s, and uh, many people are still uh, feeling it now. Uh, and you know Tom Ferrara, he's the enigma man. He, does everything about uh, Enigma machines from World War II. And also, uh, you may not realize it or know it, that he wrote a couple of books on keys, which I do have in my collection. Good guy, I've spoken to him. Um, he did a presentation at Nevik, and um, that's the presentation we'll be having uh, in August 14th. So I will officially close our meeting right now, but obviously everybody can stick wait, around. Wait, 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 one thing. And, and talk amongst right. ourselves. <laughs> yes, Steve. I just wanted to ask Alan one more question. He mentioned that he was in a Marconi site in Franklin Township operating QRP. Uh, how high up is that? Is that an awful lot of ele elevation? No, it really isn't. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, uh, familiar with uh, like where Easton Avenue is that runs from like 287 down into New Brunswick. Um, but uh, it's, it's literally on the corner of JFK Boulevard and Easton Avenue, and I think the elevation might be about 15 foot by the time you park your truck, right? <laughs> right. It, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know elevation above sea level, but it's not like it's not really elevated around the the central area. But the site is actually kind of at the base of where the transmitting antenna was, and um, back in the day, it was basically uh, 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 like a V shaped like almost like you know v-shaped wire antenna up on like these like 13 really tall poles and the, the the ground slopes up behind the site where i where the the park is so it's not at the the highest point of where it was because, but the rest of it is all houses and things like that so it's it's just you know one corner of what used to be the marconi property but yeah it's right it's literally at the corner of jfk boulevard and Easton Avenue, literally the, the patch of ground that is inside the jug handle, you know, for the exit that you take off of Easton Avenue to get onto JFK Boulevard. It's it's Italy inside that the, the jug handle. So you're practically in New Brunswick. Yeah, it's it's almost New Brunswick. It's uh yeah, it's it's it, got yeah. about another mile to go and then you get to New Brunswick. It, well, you the know, easiest you know, thing the... to find though, Steve, is if you if you look across the street from the park, there's a Somerset Diner. And then where the actual oh. park is in the parking lot, there is a stone there with a placard uh, that 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 speaks of uh, yeah. the, Marcon the Marconi yeah. site there. And, and there's a big I blue sign close right. to, close to the road that actually it's kind of half covered by bushes, but there's a big sign there. And there's a gazebo. That's why I go there. There's a tree. There's a couple of trees. There's a flagpole, but there's a couple of trees. Oh, and there's so a little get... wooden gazebo that I can you can go in and you're in the shade. And but, you're uh, also away from the rain. It, right from the rain, but I wasn't really away from the wind blowing the rain in the gazebo, yeah. which is why I escaped to the yeah. truck and then, you know. <laughs> so. I, there's, there are higher points in Franklin Township, but they're on the south end. Yeah, because what, what I've done in years past, I've done Saturday there, and then Sunday I'd go to like Washington's Rock, you know, up in oh. Greenbrook. And then yeah. I operate from there and get the strange looks from people when I'm trying to toss a wire up into one of the trees up there. Um. Speaking of operating, just in case you're interested, Alan, uh, we're going to try the net again on Tuesday night at eight about eight fifty or so okay. on three nine two five uh, lower side band. Okay. We have a little informal net going on, so oh, okay. whoever wants to come join, you're welcome. Three nine two five at what time? About a little before nine o'clock, I started. Okay. Usually, oh. ne usually Neville is there and. Last week, Steve was there, and a few other guys were there, and Joe Devonshire was there. And what, so what, day, what days of the week do you run that? That's uh, Tuesday night. Tuesday nights. Okay. I'll put a note up on my shack for that, too. So, cool. Thank you.
Thank you for the presentation. Was yeah, thanks. I found out how much I don't know, you know? <laughs> well, you know what's funny is I always find out how much I don't know about a topic when it, when it comes time to doing a video because I, I do my research and things like that and I will end up learning more than I thought. You know, I thought I knew enough to do a video until I start doing it. And then I, I realized how much I didn't know and I got to do a lot more research before I finish the video. Can I get in touch with you by email? Yeah, just uh, uh, w2aew at arrl.net. Uh, or alan.wolke at gmail.com. Your name at gmail.com? Yeah, Alan, just put a dot in between. So alan.wolke at gmail. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Alan, one more thing for you, for your QRP operations. I like to do a little QRP as I run around and uh, as I travel to some of my customers as well. Yeah. There's a, there's a, but there's a company called Jackite, J-A-C-K-I-T-E. Okay. Who makes these uh, fiberglass poles? They're extendable. Yep. And I have a 31 footer. Oh, nice. And I just, I just, I just either strap that to a, uh, and they're very lightweight. They, they pulls down to about a, about a 42 inch sections. Okay. And it extends out. They're very durable. They use them for wind socks on the beaches and things. Oh wow. Okay. And I just uh, take that and strap it to a fence post somewhere wherever I am. Run a wire from that to the to the car and. Oh, okay. I'll have to look at that because yeah, I, I use an NFED wire. Okay. Yeah, so that, perfect. it's perfect for that. But what I use is I have like a, um, uh, you know, a, a tree worker's throw bag. So it's yeah. like a little canvas bag with sand in it with a loop on it and then some throw, some throw rope. And I usually toss that up into the tree and then pull the antenna up with that. But uh, putting up a, a, you know, a, a push-up pole or a telescoping pole is, sounds like it's a lot easier. <laughs> it, it, well, it's easier, plus it also gets you to places where there may not be a tree nearby or to where your yeah, car right, is. <laughs> right, right. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Anyways, good night, all. Thanks very much for the presentation, Alan. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Bye now.